lamp unto my feet Your way is the only way for me It's a narrow
over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus
you so much for singing with us. You can take a seat. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. He made Adam and Eve, who spent their days with God until they gave into temptation by eating from a forbidden tree. Sin entered the world, and things got so bad that God flooded the earth and started over with Noah and his family. Years later, God called Abraham to follow him with the great promise to make Abraham the father of a great nation. Abraham obeyed, and God gave him a son, Isaac. Isaac's son Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph, Jacob's favorite, became second in command of Egypt. God used him to save his entire family and Egypt from starvation. Hundreds of years later, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Moses was called to lead the Israelites out of slavery. Joshua took over after Moses and led the people into the Promised Land. It's the greatest story ever told. Well, welcome to week two of the greatest story ever told. Let's recap and continue the story. Last week we began in Genesis chapter one, verse one. Sound like a good place to start, don't you think? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We talked about the fact that there is a design to everything that we see. Therefore, there is a designer, and we believe that is God is the designer of all of life. Well, God made Adam and Eve, placed them in the Garden of Eden, had one rule, said, just don't eat from this one particular particular tree. It is a way of God saying, I'm going to give you free will and you can choose for me or you can choose against me. Well, it didn't take us too long to choose against God because by Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are standing next to the tree. Serpent comes slithering in. He says, boy, if you take that fruit to Eve, I tell you what, your eyes will be open. You'll be just like God, knowing good and evil. Well, she saw that fruit. She thought it looked delicious. So she took some, gave some to her husband all hell broke loose on this earth. Oh man, their eyes were open, but not to the things that they wanted to see. Death, sickness, suffering, pain, all came to be a part of our world. Fast forward a few hundred years later, man's wickedness is so great that every inclination of the heart of man was on evil all the time. So God was grieved that he had made us, and there was one righteous man, a man by the name of Noah. God said, Noah, I want you to build an ark because I'm going to send a flood upon the earth, and I'm going to start all over again with you and with your family. So Noah begins to work on the ark for 120 years, and while he's working on that ark for 120 years, he's telling everyone to repent. The judgment of God is coming, and over the period of 120 years, not one single person repents of their sin. Well, uh, the, the rains begin to fall. God shuts the door of the ark. Forty days, forty nights it rained. Over a course of a year, Noah finally gets off the boat. God places a rainbow in the sky as a covenant to Noah that he'll never destroy us by means of a flood ever again. Well, you would have thought we'd have learned our lesson, that we would have wanted to honor God and love God and live our lives for God, but no, the evilness of man continues you to multiply. And so God said, you know what? I'm going to start all over again. And this time I'm going to start all over with a man by the name of Abram with his wife Sarai. Now we know them by Abraham and by Sarah because God or God later changes their name. He says, if you'll follow me, you'll obey me. I will make you the father of a great nation. Of course, here's the problem for Abraham and Sarah. They're well beyond the childbearing years. When God makes this covenant with this couple, Abraham is 75 years old. And Sarah is 65 years old. Well, fast forward 25 years later, and Abraham and Sarah finally have the promised child, a boy by the name of Isaac. Now, that was part one. Let's continue from here. Isaac gets older, and he marries a girl by the name of Rebekah. Now, Isaac and Rebekah have a hard time having children, just like Abraham and Sarah had a hard time having children. In fact, it took them 20 years to have a child. 
Now, you would think at some point in time during that 20 years of waiting to get pregnant that that you would have had a conversation or two about what you would name your kids if you ever had kids. But it appears that they never had the conversation. Because Genesis 25, 24 says, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. Now, now some of your Bibles have a footnote in them that says that the name Esau means hairy. So I, I'm guessing the kid came out looking like a hairy sweater. You know what I mean? Sometimes you're on the beach and a guy takes his T-shirt off and you're like, what do we have here? That is a hairy sweater. It's like saying this is our child Furby, right? That's what you're basically saying. when you, when you name. So this family is so smart. This mom and dad is so smart. They named their child after their worst physical feature. Of course, the other boy comes out and they name him Jacob. Now, now some of you, you might even have the name Jacob because your parents weren't smart enough to check out to find out what the name Jacob means. The name Jacob means deceiver. So that that means you just kind of named your kid Satan. You understand what I'm saying? That's basically... Just keeping it real right here. That's all that I'm doing. So listen, if you're expecting a child, have a conversation, would you? And then look up the meaning of the word because you don't want your child to be known as Furby and and Beelzebub. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't want to name them those two names. So Isaac and Rebecca have kids. Well, that's a good thing, right? Well, here's the problem. They're terrible parents. They don't have a clue how to be parents and they show favoritism. Isaac loves Esau, Rebecca loves Jacob. Friends, listen to me. If you want to destroy your family, it's really quite simple to do. Just pick one child over the other. That's all you got to do. Just love one child more than you love the other. Compare the two kids. Tell one of your kids that you wish they would be more like their brother or more like their sister. And you will inflict wounds upon them that your family will never recover from. Here's the thing about Esau and Jacob. They have a sibling rivalry on steroids all because of the dysfunction of their mom and their dad. Well, Jacob lives up to his name as deceiver. He tricks his brother into giving over his birthright. And, And then Rebecca comes to Jacob one day and says, I want you to get your father's blessing. So they hatch a scheme to trick Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob when it's supposed to go to Esau. And oh my goodness, when Esau found out that he'd been robbed of the blessing too, he said, Jacob, as soon as my dad dies, I'm going to kill you. If it's the last thing I do. So Jacob realizes that his brother is very serious about this. So he gets out of town as quickly as he can. And he heads to Uncle Laban's house. And Uncle Laban has two daughters. The Bible describes them. It says that Rachel was shapely and in every way beautiful. But Leah had lovely eyes. Now that doesn't sound too good for Leah, does it? We got Rachel, shapely, in every way beautiful. And how would you describe Leah? Well, she's got some good eyes. I'll tell you what, she's got some good eyes right there. Well, wait, wait, maybe we, one translation puts it this way. It says that she had weak eyes. Maybe she was cross-eyed. We don't know. Maybe she was farsighted or nearsighted. What we do know is that nobody was interested in marrying this poor girl. Well, Jacob fell in love with Rachel, and he goes to Laban and says, what do I have to do to win her hand in marriage? He said, well, if you work for me for seven years, then at the end of the seven years, you can go ahead and you can marry them, uh, uh, marry, marry her. So, so Jacob says, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Well, the seven years just goes flying by, and it's time for the wedding night for Jacob and Rachel. But the Laban isn't feeling like he wants to marry off Rachel before he marries off Leah. In that culture, it wasn't common for you to marry off the younger daughter first before the older daughter. And during that seven-year period, nobody was interested in marrying Leah. And so there's a switcheroo that takes place, and the deceiver Jacob gets deceived. Now, you say to yourself, how in the world is this possible that a guy could marry the wrong woman? Well, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking it was late at night because most marriages were done late at night. I think there was a thick veil, you know, over her face and her lovely eyes, don't you think? And I think maybe Jacob had a little too much to drink. So he thinks he's marrying Rachel, but he goes to bed and 
wakes up the next morning, rolls over, and there's, there's Leah. Now, that's a perfect description of marriage, isn't it? You think you're going to bed with Rachel and you roll over the next day and it's Leah that's there. You see what I'm saying? That's just a joke. Don't send me emails, okay? <laughs> well, Jacob's not excited about this, so he goes to Laban and says, you've tricked me. And Laban says, well, I can't marry off the younger daughter before I marry off the older daughter. And he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. You work for me another seven years and you can have Rachel right off the bat of those seven years. Well, Jacob says, all, all right, I, I guess that's what I'll do. So this is going to work out great, right? Jacob's married to two sisters. No, this is not going to work out great because he's married to two sisters. So Leah, she can have kids. Rachel can't have any kids. And Leah kind of puts it on Rachel because she's barren. And it was a big deal for women in the Old Testament to be able to give birth to kids. So Leah's cranking out one kid after another kid. So Rachel gets jealous and she goes over and she says, listen. Uh, you, Jacob, I can't seem to have any children, so sleep with my maidservant. Does that remind you of what we talked about last week? It was a common practice in the Old Testament that when you couldn't give a birth to a child, that you would offer your maidservant to your husband. So she offers the maidservant, so Jacob starts having kids through the maidservant as well. Well, guess what? Leah stops having kids. So she goes to Jacob and she says, listen, you need to sleep with my maidservant too. And Jacob's like, all right, whatever it takes, that's what I'll do. And all told, we end up with one dad, four moms, 12 sons, and one daughter. This is like a bad Maury Povich show, isn't it right there? That's a messed up stuff. Now, these 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. We'll talk more about that in a future talk. But remember that the 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Of Israel. Now, now you got to be sitting here at this point, and you're saying, this is the most dysfunctional thing I've ever read in my entire life. I mean, Todd, this is the craziest story. Why in the world would God use people like this in his amazing story? Well, write this down if you're taking notes. God uses imperfect people because that's the only kind of people he's got. Now, if anything, the book of Genesis should give you some relief. Because if God can use those dysfunctional people, maybe he can use dysfunctional you and he can use dysfunctional me as well. Well, guess what? Rachel actually has a child in the midst of all this and, and they named that child Joseph. And for Jacob, oh my goodness, Joseph is the apple of his eye. He means everything to him. And he begins to show favoritism with one son over the other sons. Now, you want to just jab. You just want to shake Jacob at this point, don't you? You want to say, Jacob, this is what messed you and Esau up, this sibling rivalry, this showing favoritism to one child over there. You th would have thought that he would have won, figured out the lesson of this. But he doesn't do it, does he? He gives a robe, a robe of many colors over to Joseph. Now, now, colors had meaning just like they do today. And so what's he basically saying is this son of mine means everything to me. Now, friends, why couldn't he have just bought enough robes for everybody? Why did he have to just buy one robe? And Joseph's about 17 years old. And he's a snot-nosed teenager, as most 17-year-olds are. So you know what he does? He wears that robe everywhere he goes. He shoves that in his brother's faces over and over and, and over again. And then one day, Joseph has a dream from God that one day he's going to be a great leader and all his brothers are going to bow down before him. And then Joseph is arrogant enough to tell his brothers about the dream. They already hated him for that stupid robe that he wore every single day. And now one day we're going to bow down before you. The Bible says that Jacob asked Joseph to go check on his brothers out in the fields. What's that tell you? It tells you that Joseph was too good to work the fields with his brothers. So they see him coming in the distance. How'd they recognize it was Joseph? You already know the answer because he's wearing that stupid robe. That's what he's doing. And so they say, well, here comes that dreamer. One of them says, you know what? I'd like to shut him up. Another brother says, I'd like to do something more. I'd like to have him killed. So they grab him. They throw him down into a pit. 
And they begin to have lunch and talk about what they're going to do to their brother. Should they kill him or do something else with him? And while they're having this discussion, some slave traders come by. And one brother says, well, I got a better idea. Whether than his blood being on our hands, let's just sell him into slavery. That's how much they hated him. And that's what they did. And then they took that robe that they despised so much. And they took an animal and they killed the animal and they took the blood of the animal and they poured it on the robe. And they went home and they threw the robe at their dad's feet and said, I guess your son was mauled by a wild animal. He's dead. Well, I guess in a sense he was, wasn't he? Because Joseph is now bound and chained and he's heading to Egypt to be a slave. Everything that he's loved, everything that he's known, well, he's been stripped of it all, hasn't he? He gets to Egypt, and a man by the name of Potiphar spies him, takes him to his house. And there's this reoccurring phrase when you read the story about Joseph in the book of Genesis. It says again and again that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And because the Lord was with Joseph, it wasn't too long before he rose in the ranks in Potiphar's house, which was pretty expansive. And he becomes second in charge. Everything's looking up a little bit for Joseph at this point. But Potiphar's got a wife. And the wife thinks that Joseph is absolutely smoking hot. And she begs him all the time, come to bed with me. Come to bed with me. Now, friends, think about this. God's given you a dream. One day you're going to be a powerful leader. And here you are as a slave. And then there's this beautiful woman that says, listen, if you sleep with me, I'm never going to tell my husband we can have this affair. Come on, Joseph. You owe yourself a little bit of pleasure. You would think he would have turned his back on God. You would think he would have said, well, you know what, God? You haven't really been faithful to me. Everything in my world is just spiraling out of control. You know, I think I'm going to go ahead and do it even though you don't want me to. A lot of us would be that way. You get angry at God. You shake your fist at God. You blame God for your circumstances. Not Joseph. Joseph looks at that woman and says, how could I do such an evil thing and sin against God and sin against my master? I won't do it. Well, she was relentless. He's in the house one day by himself, or at least he thinks he's by himself. Uh, Potiphar's wife comes in. And she grabs him by his cloak and she says, come to bed with me. Come to bed with me. Joseph says, I'm not doing that. And he kind of does a spin move to get away from her, and she rips off his cloak. This is the first streaker in the Bible as Joseph is running away from this cray-cray woman as fast as he can. And cray-cray, when the husband gets home, lies about what's happened, says that Joseph tried to make sport of her, tried to rape her. Potiphar was angry, but I don't think he believed that crazy woman. Because if he'd have believed her, he'd have had him killed. He threw him into prison. So now he's in prison for a crime he didn't even commit. While he's in prison, he meets two of Pharaoh's people. One's a cupbearer, one's a baker, and he interprets the dream. Joseph has the ability to interpret dreams. He interprets the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. He says to the cupbearer, when you go back to your royal position, would you remember me? I'm an innocent man in this prison wasting away. The Bible says that the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph until the day that the Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't interpret. And the cupbearer remembered that there was one in the prison who had interpreted a dream for him. And so he calls for Joseph to come. And Joseph comes and he interprets the dream. He says, Pharaoh, you're going to have seven years of famine. I mean, seven years of plenty. And then you're going to have seven years of famine. Now, if you're a smart Pharaoh, and I believe that you are, you'll probably want to put somebody in charge of the seven years of plenty so they can store up for the seven years of famine. The Pharaoh looks at Joseph and says, you're no ordinary Joe. I don't care if you laugh or not. I enjoy that joke, okay? I'm going to use it till the day I die. You're no ordinary Joe. I'm going to put you in charge. And so Joseph becomes second in charge of all of Egypt. What's he do for the first seven years? He stores up all this plenty. And the famine hits. Guess who comes looking for food? But his brothers. And they don't recognize him. It's been a long time since they've seen each other. Now here are the people who sold you. The people who did damage to you, abused you, 
wounded you, tried to crush you, what would you do in this moment? You're second in charge. You have all authority and all power. If you say off with their heads, then off with their heads it will be. Joseph chose to forgive them. This is what the Bible says. He says, you intended to hurt me, but God used what you did to save all of these lives. I love Joseph, kind of a hero in the Old Testament because he understood that even through the pain, even through the heartache, that God was working this plan and this plan was going to work. He just wouldn't give up. He, would, he just kept holding on, didn't he? He just kept holding on. And I think Joseph had a different perspective. I think he realized that God needed him in that royal position and that God used every circumstance of his life to get him prepared for that royal position. Being second in charge of Potiphar's house, he becomes second in charge of that prison as well. It was all preparing him with the leadership skills necessary to be second in charge of Egypt. I think he also knew that there was no hope for his family or for the Jewish race if he wasn't in that lofty position. My goodness, when the famine hit, they come looking for food. If Joseph isn't in that royal position, can I tell you what's going to happen to this family? They're going to starve to death. They're not going to survive. And if Jacob's family doesn't survive, guess what? The Jewish race is wiped off the face of the earth. And if the Jewish race is wiped off the face of the earth, guess what? There is no Messiah. Because the Messiah has to come from the line of Abraham. And so if that's not happening, if the Jewish people don't exist, there is no Messiah, and that means there's no hope for you and for me. Now, we've been looking at the contrast through the story between Jesus and some of the Old Testament characters. Let's look at the contrast between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. It's amazing, the parallels. Joseph was stripped of his robe, so was Jesus. Joseph was sold by his brothers for a few pieces of silver. Jesus was sold out for a few pieces of silver by Judas. Joseph was betrayed by the ones he loved. So was Jesus. Joseph's brothers deserted him. Jesus' disciples left him to face his execution alone. Joseph was falsely accused. So was Jesus. Isn't that awesome? It all points to Jesus, doesn't it? It all points, all points to Jesus. So what's Joseph do? He's in this lofty position. He forgives his brothers. He says, I love you guys. Get dad, get my other brother, and move here. Move here to Egypt. And for a brief amount of time, they do quite well. I mean, they do quite well. And they're populating all around, and they're having a great time. Well, guess what? Joseph dies. And as a result of, of Joseph's death, well, the Bible tells us that a new Pharaoh years later came into power. And this new Pharaoh didn't know anything about Joseph. So he's looking out over his kingdom and he says, oh my goodness, I've got myself a problem. There's this other race of people called the Jews and they're populating so quickly that they outnumber the Egyptians. And if they rebel, they revolt against Egypt. I'm going to lose my throne, my power, my position. So the Pharaoh makes a decision. He says, I'm going to put these people into slavery. And for 400 years, the Israelites, the Jewish race, is placed into slavery under the Egyptians. Well, God hears the cries of his people. And he sends in a deliverer, a man by the name of Moses. Now, Moses is interesting. Now we're in the book of Exodus. He's interesting because he's not interested in helping his people out. He's tried that years ago, and he's fallen on his face. And he just wants to stay out in the wilderness and tend sheep. So he gives God a list of reasons as to why he's not the right guy for the job. But have you ever tried to tell God no? It doesn't work so well. And so God says, well, you're going to go. And so Moses goes, and he goes to the Pharaoh, and he says, you need to let God's people go. And the Pharaoh says no. Now, the band's kind of already out here, and they're going to sing a song for us about what we think the conversation might have been like between Pharaoh and between Moses. And then I'm going to come back. And I'm going to finish this section. So don't skip out early, okay? Here we go. I stand before the oppressor Who wants to keep me in chains I say
sing my God is a God of freedom Don't underestimate his strength I hear that boast of the tyrant Seeing my backs to a wall He drew a sword thinking he was over Guess he don't know my God at all Freedom For me with strength and mercy And he's never lost a fight The jux of the conversation was, let my people go, <laughs> and the Pharaoh said, oh, no, we're not going to do that. Now, there's a series of plagues that take place as a result of this that I want you to see. Now, every single plague that happens is, is in retaliation to the Egyptian gods. The one true living God is showing that the gods that the Egyptians have been worshipped are all false gods and that he has power over everything. Let me, let me show you the plagues. The first plague was God turning the river to blood. They worshipped the Nile River. So God said, you want to worship it? Why don't you worship a big old pile of blood? Second plague was frogs. Guess what? They had a God that was looked like a frog. They worshipped frogs. Frogs. I eat frog legs. They worship frogs. It's weird. Third plague was gnats. Fourth plague was flies. Then there was an epidemic on their livestock. Now, cows are dropping like flies, okay? The sixth plague is boils appeared on people's skin. The seventh plague is hail began to fall from the sky. So all hail now has broken loose. The eighth plague is locusts. The ninth plague is darkness that consumed the country. And the final plague was the plague of the death angel. Now, this is where we get the Passover from, right? After all these plagues, the final plague is this death angel. What the death angel is going to do is he's going to pass over every single house and enter into them. He's going to enter into the Jewish people's homes. He's going to enter into the Egyptian people's homes. 
And if their door frame of their home isn't painted with the blood of a lamb, the death angel is going to come in and kill the firstborn son or their firstborn of their livestock. The blood of the lamb is what's going to protect them. Now, this is a foreshadowing once again, right? Jesus is the lamb of God. One day the death angel is going to come for you and for me, and it's because of the blood of Jesus Christ poured on the doorframe of our heart that when the death angel comes and enters in, he will pass over us and no harm will come to us. Can you imagine what that night was like? It says, on that night I'll pass through Egypt, strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Well, that was it for the Pharaoh. After the plague of the death angel, that was it. He said, get these people out of here. I don't want these people around me anymore. And he releases his slaves, and Moses begins to lead them towards the wilderness to get to the promised land. But guess what? The Pharaoh changes his mind, and so he tells his army to go get them and bring them back. He realizes he's going to tank his economy as a result of losing his free slaves. And so the most powerful army is barreling down upon the Jewish people. And the Jewish people now find themselves with the Red Sea on one side and the most powerful army at the time on the other side. And so they cry out to Moses and Moses cries out to God. And and God says, Moses, take your staff and raise it up. And when he did, the Red Sea parted. And then the children of Israel walked across on dry land. And then when the Egyptian army tried to follow suit, guess what? The waters receded and consumed the Egyptian army. God begins to lead the people to the cusp of the promised land. He's there with them but a fire by night and a cloud by day. He's taking care of their food. He's taking care of their water. He's giving them the Ten Commandments to live by. Can you imagine a society that actually lives according to the Ten Commandments? God's taken care of them. They get to the cusp of the promised land. They send in 12 spies to scope out the land. 10 of the 12 spies come back and say, oh my goodness, the land is beautiful. The land is flowing with milk and honey. It's good land. But here's the problem. There's giants in the land. And there's no way that our God is big enough to defeat the giants. Only two of the spies believed that God could do it, Joshua and Caleb. So God said, fine, that's the way you want it to be. That's the way it's going to be. You don't want to trust me? You, you, you want to be faithful to me? Haven't I already shown my power to you and all the plagues that I've given? Haven't I just shown you my power by parting the Red Sea, and yet you still don't have faith in me? Fine, you will not set one pinky toe into the promised land. You will wander around the desert for the next 40 years, and every single one of you is going to die. Because you didn't believe in me. You didn't have faith in me. You didn't trust in me. Your kids will inherit it. Joshua and Caleb will inherit it, but you won't. And that's what happened. They wandered around the desert for the next 40 years. They dropped like flies out in that desert. And then one day God came to Joshua and said, it's go time. It's time to enter the promised land. Now, friends, listen to me. In life, it's always going to be this way. It's going to be between fear and faith. Fear and faith. What's going to win in your life? All those opportunities God gives you, all those times that you should speak up, all those times that he wants to place you in this position for such a time as this, will you let fear beat you and shrink you back down, or will you move forward in faith? I think that's why Joshua chapter 1 opens the way that it does. God says to him, he gives him a pep talk. He says, nobody will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give to them. God promised Joshua that he would lead them into the promised land. Now, let me be honest with you. The book of Joshua, if you ever read it, it's a bloody book. Oh, it's a bloody book. One war after another war, and they just obliterate the people who lived there. Just obliterated them. Now, this is where a lot of people think think that this is where we have a God of wrath in the Old Testament, you know. I mean, why in the world would God allow the Jewish people to come in there and just obliterate these people from the face of the earth? Genesis 15, 16, when God makes the promise to Abraham, he says this, the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. 
Andy Stanley writes this, while the Jewish people were in Egypt in slavery, the people who lived in the promised land were busy creating cultures that were very pagan. There was no regard for human life. Idol worship was rampant. They had sex with animals. Incest was practiced. They sexually abused women, and they sacrificed their children to false gods. The phrase full measure means that God was giving them time and opportunity to repent and abandon their wicked ways. God waited 400 years for them to repent. And they didn't do it. Time of Noah, how many years? 120 years. Not one person repented of their sin. Can I ask you a question? How long has he been waiting for you? Because you sit here without a relationship with God, you say you have no need for him. You know what's interesting about about, about humankind is that is God's more willing to forgive us than we're willing to ask for forgiveness. Don't you find that to be a little bit strange? That God is more willing to forgive us for our sins than we are willing to ask for his forgiveness. That there was this little boy, his name was Billy, and he had a little sister that he just adored, thought she was the greatest thing. And she had some disabilities. She was confined to a wheelchair. When Billy was in the fourth grade, his sister passed away. He was devastated, and he didn't know how to respond. He didn't know how to deal with the grief that he was feeling inside, so he lashed out. He became a very bad boy, getting himself in all kinds of trouble, just lashing out in anger any chance that he got. Well, by the time he entered the seventh grade, he had put together quite a book. You know how teachers will write books about each of the students and so they can pass it on to the next teacher? So the first day of school, the seventh grade teacher, a man by the name of Mr. Smith, is sitting up there, and he's reading every offense that this kid has done throughout the years, page after page after page, and he's looking across the way over at Billy. Finally, the teacher closes the folder, and he says, Billy, I want you to come up here. I want you to sit in the very front row right in, the, right in front of my desk. And Billy's thinking, I haven't done anything wrong yet. Why are you doing that to me? So he comes up there, and he kind of sits down. You know, he's kind of got a little bit of an attitude. And the teacher looks at Billy and says, I've been reading all about you. Look at me, boy. I want you to know I don't believe a word of it. And then he ripped it up. He threw it in the trash can. About three days later, Billy found himself in Sunday school class. The teacher asked a simple question. She says, do you know anybody like Jesus? Billy, with a smile on his face, said, I know one, my teacher, Mr. Smith. Why don't you repent? Why not come clean? Why not ask him for forgiveness? For those who have, we know something, don't we? We know that if we confess our sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> he gives us a second chance. You see, God walks with failures as if they've never failed. And that's why this is the greatest story ever told. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what's it going to take for us to come to our senses? Because I know there are people in this room and people watching me at home that still haven't made things right with you, they're still stubborn still won't ask for grace, still won't ask for forgiveness. They still have no need of you. But Lord, they're hurting. They feel shame. They feel regret. They're carrying this load with them everywhere they go. Lord, I pray, I pray that today would be the day that they would give it over to you, that they would confess their sins and trust you, Lord, to be the leader and forgiver of their life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God's forgiveness is immediate. When we turn from our sins and ask God to forgive us, He doesn't take a while to think about it. All it takes is a simple prayer, a prayer between you and God. Sometimes you might not feel comfortable with that. 
If you've reached a point where you want to ask God for forgiveness, but you're not sure how to start, or maybe you have other questions, give us a call or text us at 505-922-9200. We'd love to hear from you and have a team of people ready to talk with you. And don't forget that you can head over to the Sagebrush app at any time and send us a message, request prayer, or make a decision in your faith. There, you can also learn about what it means to accept Christ into your life, serve, join a small group, or even get baptized. Baptism is one of the most important first steps we can take as a believer in Christ. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you haven't been baptized, head over to our website and find out the next available time for you to make that decision in your faith. If you don't live near a sagebrush, send us a message and we can help you find out how you can get baptized. We've been loving this series. Going through all of the books really does show how the Bible is the greatest story ever told. If you've missed any messages, you can watch them all on our app or head over to our website, sagebrush.church, to catch up on them. And don't forget, we'd love to see you in person. If you're in the Albuquerque or surrounding areas, there is a Sagebrush in your neighborhood. Head over to the app or sagebrush.church slash locations to find the Sagebrush nearest to you. Thank you once again for joining us today. We'll see you next week for another teaching on the greatest story ever told.